Good morning and a happy Sabbath to each one of you. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Many of you um, that are watching today um, need you to be reminded that uh, our church is open and we are fully functioning as a organization, as a church. We're glad that uh, we still have the many uh, hand washing uh, and wipes and masks if you want them. But we want to invite you back to church and uh, encourage you to join us. It's a wonderful to see you in person. Uh, last Sabbath, we had an uh, amazing Sabbath, and many of you were there. Uh, we had a baptism. We had a church service at the Garden Center. And um, uh, today, the whole church doesn't look as lively as it did last week. <laughs> we had... Uh, uh, our church is a beautiful church, but last week, uh, of course, for those of you watching that weren't there, we had uh, uh, a lot of flowers, we had a lot of uh, uh, different shrubs and trees around, and so uh, we were glad to be able to uh, be there. Following the service, we had a baptism at the river, and we have a couple of gentlemen that were there that day and got baptized, so I just want to say Congratulations, and we appreciate your willingness and commit your life to Christ, and that was very positive. Uh, and then, of course, uh, following the baptism, uh, we had some great food, and it was just a great afternoon and a great day, and so uh, we were really blessed, and I know that uh, all of us that uh, were there will be happy to do again, I'm sure, in the future. We're just not quite sure when, uh, but um, again, we want to welcome you and say happy Sabbath. And uh, for those of you who are visiting, uh, we are glad that you've chosen to be with us today and uh, all the blessings that we uh, can give to you. This morning, I'm going to ask Sister Andrews to come up and share with us something uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, important. Uh, Sister Andrews, a while back ago, I also asked her to talk about the church budget. And uh, she very kindly put something in our are um, the mailbox and I'm not sure if that's what she's going to talk about today but it's it's something that uh, she worked at and so Sister Andrews uh, share with us uh, some of the things that you'd have us know today in your mailboxes you will find a sheet of paper with a list of all the things that church budget uh, supports uh, a, few week, a couple of weeks ago or so Greg asked me to come up and I had a total blank I couldn't remember hardly any of them. So I thought, well, I'll put it down on a piece of paper for you. You can look at it and you can choose what you want to support from church budget or just plain church budget. But if you have a specific uh, thing like personal ministries or building renovation and that, you can do that specifically on your envelopes. So I'd, I'd like you to check your boxes and pick up this and then take it home and take a look at it. I'd like to share something else with you this morning. I had an interesting experience this week. Uh, my car is not new anymore, uh, but it still gets me around. And I've, in all the years we've had it, I've hardly spent anything on it. So I guess I kind of took for granted it was going to keep on going. But I got up to the church here on Thursday. As I was about to turn into the lot, I lost power steering. And of course, you can't go anywhere these days without your power steering on those cars. But I managed to get it turned so that it just kind of got itself into the lot because it's a little downhill grade. Well, I finally got a hold of the motor club and everything. but. To back up a little bit, I was planning to go to Penticton on Wednesday. I felt great when I got up, and I thought, this is a good day to go. But about the time I was ready to leave, I suddenly had a horrible pain attack, and I felt so exhausted I could hardly make it across the room. So, of course, I didn't go anywhere. Spent the day sleeping off and on, and evening I felt fine. And when I look back at it, if I had gone on Wednesday, I would have been stuck somewhere between here and Penticton. Mm -hmm. It was the ignition module, which uh, without that, car goes nowhere. But pastor's da uh, sister was here, or came as I was about to get help, 
and she insisted on driving me home so I didn't have to walk in the sun. So, you know, God looks after us and we ask him to, to lead us and to stop us from doing things sometimes if it's not what we're supposed to do that day. And I just thank the Lord that he's looked after me. Thank you, Sister Andrews, for sharing that. And, uh, you know, God is so good. He uh, is um, uh, looking out for us, even when we don't uh, appreciate or realize it. But, Sister Andrews, as you uh, mentioned that, uh, your prayer request that you invited God to stop us uh, when we're about to do something dumb, that's that's a very important point, uh, one that I forget all the time because um, I usually do something dumb and then add, ask God to bless it. So... Um, uh, it's it's important that we uh, uh, look at our prayer life and realize what uh, God is doing. And thank you for sharing that with us because it is um, these things that you've just mentioned here today give us all courage and uh, it gives us gratitude for uh, what God is doing in our life. And sometimes um, it is only after we see these things happen do we see God's working? At the time, we're just frustrated and annoyed, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, certainly the case. Um, as you were t- saying that, uh, telling us a uh, story reminded me of one when the kids were much smaller. We were on our way to camp meeting, and uh, we had our truck with a camper, and we were leaving Asuyas, and I very distinctly remember the, the temperature on the big reader board was 108 degrees, and I thought, that's pretty warm. And I get up th- um, by the airport, and we blow a radiator hose. And I thought, you know, uh, I could grumble or I could be really grateful because I'm glad that I could coast back down to the Husky, get another hose, and I was on my way in a few minutes' time uh, versus uh, two hours down the road. So uh, those things that have happened, be it in automobiles, et cetera, are, are important to remember how God leads. And thank you for sharing with us this morning. And as you mentioned, there is this very cool letter that uh, you will see in your um, church mailbox. And so... <clears throat> There is about a dozen different things that your money goes for on the local church budget. Later today, um, Josiah, which I saw here earlier, will be sharing with us um, the offering for the world budget. And so uh, a similar situation will happen there. This morning, we're glad that we can uh, see what is taking place around the world. And we are going to see our our, uh, program for uh, Mission Spotlight Following that, uh, we're going to be able to sing praises together.
Japan. It is. Uh, it brings me great joy today to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the wonderful name of God the Spirit. that we got to have into our church just last Sabbath. We thought we'd share that instead of Mission Spotlight, which you can still go and see on the Mission Spotlight website. So this morning we're going to begin our praise time with a song from the chorus book, and it's number four. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. next song today is in the hymnal and it's number 286 wonderful words of life
next song is back in the chorus book, and it's number 150, Follow Jesus. next song is back in the hymnal and it's a song that I love very much and it is, it is number 92 this is my father's word glad and stand for our opening song, hymn number 221, Rejoice the Lord is King.
thank you for singing with us today, and you may be seated. I appreciate uh, these young people leading and singing, and uh, I was uh, really pleased about this mission spotlight that we saw earlier. Wasn't that great? Uh, that was fantastic. I'm glad that uh, they focused on Oliver or Nasuyas. Uh, this is this is nice to have. And oh, don't I want to thank you for putting that uh, video together. You did an exceptional job, and so we really appreciate that. Um, this morning, I'm going to call Josiah over here and uh, have him share with us a uh, important uh, thing that we, as a church, we have uh, not only a church here locally, but we are part of a much larger organization. So, Josiah. Tell us about what our offering for is today. Okay. Happy Sabbath. Uh, our offering today is to the, what is it again? Right. <laughs> the Wood Church Budget. So we don't get to this all the time, but what's really important about this offering is it goes to everything we're doing around the earth. You know, whether it's uh, missionary work, building churches, just helping others in need. It's a really good way to give and to see it impact others around the world. So if you're not here today and you want to do an offering, you can go on to our website online and give it there. And if you're here, then you can take place in the offering today. Thank you. We're glad that uh, we have a, a Bibles. And uh, Rel, uh, you have a digital Bible with you this morning. And I'm going to ask you to come up and share with us uh, a particular text that is in your bulletin and the one that uh, you'll uh, enjoy understanding fuller today. It is from Genesis chapter 42, 21 to 23. Rel, could you share that with us? Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Please open your Bible as we read the scripture from Genesis 42, verse 21 to 23. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because our brother, of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with, with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ralph, for sharing that with us this morning. There's an important announcement that I forgot to mention, but this is a perfect time to mention. In your bulletin, it says, we are blessed to have Pastor Greg Wellman speaking to us today. <laughs> and so, Pastor Wellman, we, uh, we want to reiterate that uh, important announcement, and thank you for being with us, and we've always enjoyed your presentations and thoughts. Well, thank you. It's good to be here in uh, church here in Osuyas. Hi, Donna. And um, I just wanted to share a little thought that I heard and that Josiah talked to me about a little bit that you might find interesting. You know, we have Camp Hope down in Hope, and we've all heard of the fires from Lytton and, and the devastation that has gone on. Um, but I understand Camp Hope is going to be housing about 400 of our uh, First Nations people down there for up to three months. So please pray for Camp Hope. And uh, they have a, quite a ministry, but it's a good ministry to help those in need right now. So it is a privilege to have Camp Hope at this time and, uh, and keep them in our prayers. Well, as you can see, we're going to talk about Joseph. Now, this is a part six of a series I've been doing up in Penticton. Now, I know you've only heard about one or two parts, but I, I'm going to trust. I believe you know some of the story of Joseph. God has worked in Joseph's life. In fact, there's more in Genesis of Joseph than any other person in, in the book of Genesis. Genesis or Joseph is a real example for us in these days of how to live and how to serve God. Now, Joseph, this is, title is called Joseph and the Investigative Judgment. 
Now you're probably thinking, what does Joseph have to do with the investigative judgment, the judgment of God? Isn't that something at the end of time in the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel? Isn't God's judgment later? How could it be during the time of Joseph? Well, I want to, hopefully I can illustrate this just a little bit. Um, Some people call this the pre-advent judgment. Uh, Our Jewish people call it Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, facing life's record. But the Bible does speak about God's judgment. Now, there are some times I hear some people, and I've had them tell me that they no longer believe in the judgment. They no longer believe in, in God's investigative judgment. With a teaching like that, No one can have any assurance of salvation. You don't know if you're saved or lost if you have this investigative judgment. Or they say, this teaching keeps you in a continual state of anxiety regarding your standing with God. Or some say the investigative judgment suggests that God is examining our lives, and if we are not absolutely perfect, we are lost. Is that what the Bible really teaches? What is the investigative judgment? Well, we're going to get into that with the life of Joseph, but I do want to just share that the Bible speaks of God's judgment. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the three angels' message has this call that's to go to all the world. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting, what? Gospel, the everlasting good news of Jesus and his death for us, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Who is that? That's everybody, isn't it? That includes the entire global world. And so this last message of Revelation is to go to all the world, and the angel was saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. In other words, take God serious. Turn your thoughts and your mind and your heart to God. Study His words. Take Him seriously. Then it says, for the hour of His what? His judgment has come. His judgment has come. We're going to be living in the judgment hour before the final events of this world. The judgment will be taking place. And then it says, worship him. Worship this great God, this wonderful God who's going to bring the sin problem, the suffering of sin to an end. Worship God who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the springs of water. God is worthy to be worshiped and served. And so there's this idea, the hour of his judgment has come. Now, the Bible is pretty clear. There's going to be a judgment. God is being judged, and we're going to be judged. And we're going to get into that a little later. But Paul says that, for we must all appear before the what? Judgment seat. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear that there's a judgment, right? We're all, now that's kind of sometimes it's spooky or people don't like that term, but the Bible is very clear that there's a judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or evil. There's a judgment. It's pretty clear. Now, people deny this investigative judgment, and they don't believe that God judges, but this idea of judgment and investigative judgment is seen throughout Scripture. In the book of Genesis, you remember when Adam and Eve sinned? God came down and he said, Who told you that you were naked? Now, did God know? But why did he ask? He investigated Adam and Eve. And he says, who told you that you were naked? I mean, God knew that they had fallen and they had separated themselves from him. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, did did God know that they disobeyed? But why did he ask him the question? Why was he investigating? He wanted them to kind of think about their actions. And then Cain and Abel, in the next chapter of Genesis 4, 
It says, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Remember, Cain and Abel, Abel's sacrifice was acceptable. Cain, you know, wasn't offering the sacrifice that God wanted. Cain became angry. Why are you angry, Cain? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God is investigating Cain and talking to him and saying, Cain, what's going on? You know, why do you feel like this? Did God know? But he wants Cain to think and, and wake up and analyze itself. Here's the days of Noah. God comes down and he investigates. And he says, God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. But God investigated how wicked this world was, but he found Noah and his family. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about why did God investigate? What is this investigation judgment all about? And then Abraham, Genesis 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, God actually already knew what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he wanted to carry Abraham and others. He wanted to help them understand what he was doing. So he comes down to investigate, not because God doesn't know, but because he wants others to understand his character, his judgment, and why he does what he does. Now, here is the, probably the most important picture of the investigative judgment in all the Bible. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated and his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. This is quite an impressive scene of God's uh, a great setting of judgment. And there's fire and there's glory and there's blazing and it's a, quite a powerful thing. And then it says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Here's this massive, glorious fire. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The what? Can you read that? The court was seated and the books were open. The court. What's that mean? The court was open. Does that give a judgment picture? And the books were open. What are those books about? Why did they open the books? Now, I, can I ask a question? Is God saying, you know, I can't remember. I forgot that person. Or I can't remember what they did. So would you please open the books so I can be reminded? Is that what's happening here? God said, I forgot Joe Alexander. Did he, when did he live? And what was he doing? What was, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Would you please open the book so I can be remind myself? Does God forget? Does God need to know something about the books and find out who you are? God knows everything, right? God knows whether you're saved or lost. God knows it all. So why do you need a judgment? And why are these books... Why are these books open? Well, if you notice, it says there in this verse, it says, a thousand thousands minister to him, 10,000 times 10,000. Now, I like what the NLT, the New Living Translation says. It says, millions of angels ministered to him Many millions stood before him. So you get that. The Hebrew doesn't have any word beyond a thousand. So when they try to make a big group, they just say thousands and thousands, or 10,000 times 10,000. 
Now, we know we can go up to millions and billions and trillions and gillions. And, you know, we have these words that we use for lots of angels. And so God had all these angels up in heaven, many, many angels. And the books are open because God wants to show his books to the angels. Now, there's three sources I'm going to I'm going to quote the same thing, but you can find them all three places. This is the teachings of the Bible, but I'm just going to explain the Seventh-day Adventists believe in the 28th a biblical exposition of fundamental doctrines, or the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual, the 17th edition, page 18, or the Baptismal Certificate, belief number 24. These are the great teachings of the Bible the great lessons that the Bible has within them. And this is the explanation. The investigative judgment, what is it? It reveals to heavenly intelligences, the angels, who among the dead are asleep in Christ and therefore in Him are deemed worthy to have a part in the first resurrection. It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and in Him therefore are ready for translation into His everlasting kingdom. So the angels are looking at the books. They want to find out why God is bringing people back to heaven, right? Now, why are they doing that? You have to realize that God, His angels, just kicked, remember a few thousand years ago, Lucifer and his angels rebelled up in heaven. Remember that story? They were bad. They rebelled. And God, Michael, and all his angels had to kick these angels, one-third of the angels, out of heaven. Because they were bad people. And then God comes along and says, you know, I'm going to bring all these sinners back to heaven. What? That doesn't make any sense, God. You're going to bring these people back to heaven? We just cleaned heaven up. We just had a big battle and kicked the devil out of heaven and all his evil angels. And you're going to bring all those sinners from earth back to heaven? And God says, look at the books. Let me show you why they are safe to save. Let me show you the change of their life. This judgment vindicates the justice of God. It shows that God has been fair and just and that He he died to take their sins, forgiven their sins, that how He has worked out the plan of salvation, it vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus it declares that those who have remained loyal to God will receive the kingdom. So the angels are looking at these books to see why God is bringing them back to heaven. Now, the Bible says that the ancient of days came. There's a great judgment scene. Now, notice this. It says, And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. The angels say, God, we see what you've done. We see how you've worked. We've seen how these people have changed and accepted you. We put our stamp of approval. A judgment was made in favor of the saints. Yes, Lord, bring them back to heaven. We believe that you have saved their souls. And so a judgment was made in favor of the saints. Now, in the book of John, Jesus says these words of hope and encouragement. He says, very truly, I tell you, Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Do you believe in Jesus? Have you accepted him? Do you love him and follow him? You have eternal life and will not be condemned when your name comes up in the judgment. Now, some people have misunderstood this verse because some Bible translations use the word will not come up in judgment but has crossed over from death to life. And so they read this, that we will not be judged. They always read this verse, will not be judged, because 
we will not be judged, but the real interpretation, we will not be condemned. There's no condemnation in the judgment for those who are in Christ and following Jesus. Now, what does that have to do with Joseph? How does Joseph play out in the investigative judgment? Well, let's quickly go through this story, and I, I want to hopefully we'll share with you how this illustrates God's investigative judgment. Remember, there's a famine in the land during the days of Joseph. Seven years of plenty and seven years of drought. And two years had gone into the drought. And there was no food in the land. In all the world, there was no food. And in chapter 24 of the book of Genesis, it says, when Jacob, that's Joseph's father and the father of the 12 patriarchs, it says, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He's a good practical dad. He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. I like that. Why do you just keep looking at each other? Isn't there a time to just get up and get going and action? We don't need another prayer meeting, a Bible study, or another committee. Just go and do something. And so Jacob tells him, Get down there to Egypt and buy some grain, right? That's a good thing. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin, little Benjamin, Joseph's other brother, little brother, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. Now, we, un- you know, Jacob with a smothering father. He had a spoiled little son. He had two of them, Joseph and Benjamin. But now Benjamin is that little precious one. Any of you grew up in a family and you knew somebody was a little more spoiled than, you know, any of you had a family that you said, well, I think, I think my little sister, my little brother, they were the spoiled one. They, they got all the attention. Yeah, you know, I have a family of five. We know our little sister was a spoil. We know that. That's, that's common knowledge in our house. Our little sister, she seemed to get more love and attention. But anyhow, in this case, it was Benjamin got doted on. He was the favorite one. Now, Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brother came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. I mean, that was, that was, Joseph must have remembered his childhood dream. Now he underst- now it makes sense why he, God gave him that dream. All his brothers were bowing down to him. Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them. Ten of these brothers. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Cana to buy food. Now, Joseph talks like an Egyptian. He dresses like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. His hair is like an Egyptian. I mean, he's been 22 years in Egypt. He was 17 when he was sold. So he's been more Egyptianized than he was, a, you know. He's been down there a long time. He's clean-shaven, like an Egyptian. He has a hat like an Egyptian. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. What's he going to do? He knows these are his ten brothers, and so he's going to investigate. He's going to investigate these ten brothers brothers of his. He wants to find out for himself as his brothers are the same old, ornery, mean, cruel, harsh, calloused, hard-hearted men they used to be, or have they changed? What has happened to Benjamin? He, he's not God. He doesn't know their hearts. He doesn't know the story. It's been 22 years, and he wants to investigate 
And is his dad alive or have they mistreated him too? So Joseph sees his brothers. 22 years has gone by and he wonders, who are these rascals now? Who are they? And he says, he's going to test them out. He says, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. <laughs> now, he's just, he wants to find out. He wants to test them and draw out who they really are. So he's going to put the squeeze on them a little bit. No, my Lord, they say. They answered, your servants have come to buy food. Is that true? Yes, they came to prevent their families from dying. We are all sons of one man. Is that true? One man, but four wives. <laughs> well, in this case, it would be three wives because Benjamin and Joseph would be from Rachel. So they were from three wives. And then they say this, your servants are what? Honest men, not spies, and I'm sure Joe, you're honest men. I know you guys. You weren't honest with me, right? You sold me. You got rid of me. You guys claim to be honest? So he says, no, he said to them. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants are 12 brothers the sons of one man who live in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with the father. Is that true? Benjamin stayed behind. And one is no more. We don't know what happened to him. He's gone. Where is he? He's talking to him. He's standing right in front of them. One is no more. But there he is. Isn't that interesting? So Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you. <laughs> you are spies. He's just kind of really, he's giving it to them. He wants to really know what, what's his family? What are they like now? Who, what are they turned out to be? And this is how you will be tested. He's going to test them. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Joseph wants to know, he wants to investigate what his brothers have done with Benjamin. Do they treat him the same way that they've treated him? Did they get rid of Benjamin? Send one of your number to get your brother. Joseph wants to see. I want to see Benjamin. Go get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth, because I know you're a bunch of liars, <laughs> but he's testing them. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies, and he put them all in custody for three days. Way to go, Joseph. You know, just Didn't they deserve to be put in prison for at least three days? I mean, Joseph had been a slave, for 10 years, and he'd been in a dungeon for three. I mean, it, Joseph has had it pretty rough. So he puts them in three days, and not one of the brothers volunteers to go back. Did you know that? Not one of the brothers decided to go back to get Benjamin. And I like what a book called Patriarchs and Prophets has to say about this story. It says, It appeared probable that they were to be put to death or to be made slaves, and if Benjamin were brought, it might be only to share their fate. They decided to remain and suffer together rather than bring additional sorrow upon their father by the loss of his only remaining son. They were accordingly cast into prison where they remained three days. Not one of the brothers wanted to go back and get Benjamin. They knew that would just crush their dad too much, and they'd they didn't know if they were going to live or die. And so Joseph sees what's going on with their brothers, and he says, On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. Joseph says, I, I fear God. 
I too am a God-fearing man. If you are honest, men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back to your starving household. One of you will stay here, and the rest of you can go home. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified. Because Joseph doesn't know if they're a bunch of mean old men, right? I want to see Benjamin because it's been 22 years. And that you may not die. Your words, this they proceeded to do. They agreed with it. Sure, let's do it. Okay, one of them will stay behind. Now, the Bible is very interesting in this. It says that they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. Now, again, I want to reflect back on or go back to patriarchs and prophets. It speaks about these brothers where it says, During the years since Joseph had been separated from his brothers, these sons of Jacob had changed. In character, envious, turbulent, deceptive, cruel, and revengeful, they had been. But now, when tested by adversity, they were shown to be unselfish, true to one another, devoted to their father, and themselves middle-aged men, subject to his authority. Aren't you glad you're not what you used to be? Anybody? Anybody? Aren't you glad you're not what you used to be when you were younger, when you were rebellious? These boys had been bad boys. They had sold Joseph. But they had grown up and matured and changed and had become godly, unselfish, loyal to one another, faithful. And here they are in Egypt being tested. And the Bible says, this is our scripture reading, then they said to one another, notice this, we are truly, what? Guilty. Concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pled, when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. What's going on? They're feeling guilty. Guilty. Just a minute. It's been 22 years, and they're still being smitten by their mistake. This distress has come upon us. Do you ever, have you ever gone through a trouble, a hard time? And you think, I think that's happening because of some sin I did. <laughs> because I was disobedient to my parents or I wasn't kind to my teacher. You know, and God's punishing me. Yeah? You know, sometimes we think we're being punished because of our sins. And then Reuben pipes up and he says, he answered them saying, Did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. I mean, it's 22 years has passed, and they're still feeling the weight, the guilt, the shame of their sin. It's a terrible struggle. They're going through this agony. It's, it's not easy. Now, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And the Bible says he turned away from them and began to weep. What was all that about? He turns away and he gets tears in his eyes and he starts to weep. Why? He recognizes 
made, they're sorry for what they've done. They really are feeling guilty. They're feeling ashamed. They are, they're, they wish they wouldn't have done it. He weeps. He says, these are not the same boys. But he's not sure. He's still human. So here's the plan. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Who? Simeon. There was ten boys. He chose Simeon. Why did he choose Simeon? Joseph commanded that Simeon be bound before them and again committed to prison. In the cruel treatment of their brother, Simeon had been the instigator and chief actor And it was for this reason that the choice fell upon him. (laughs) You know, it was actually Simeon who had come up with his plan to sell Joseph. And so now Simeon reaps what he sowed, right? Yeah. But Joseph is his brother. He's He's watching over them. He's taking care of them. Now, in wrapping up, notice this verse. How does Joseph respond to his brothers? Is he mean? Is he going to be cruel? He's testing them. He's investigating them. But the Bible says Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain. Fill them up with grain. And to put each man's silver back in his sack. Be really, really kind. Give them all their money back. Really? Really. Be kind. And to give them provisions for their journey. He's testing them, but he's also watching out for them. He's giving them grain. He's giving them treasures. He's giving them provisions for their journey. Now, we are living in the investigative judgment. We're going to be judged. And I think often we feel guilty. We're guilty. We're sinners. We've made mistakes. But we have a high priest, a savior, who gives us grain and gives us treasures in his word. And he gives us provisions for our journey through this world. And I love this verse. I've never preached on this verse ever before in my life. This was a verse I found, and I have never used it ever before except in this sermon. Now, you follow this. Listen to this. Because I have sinned against him. Have you sinned? Have you made mistakes? Have you sometimes feel guilty for what you've done? I have sinned against him. I will bear the Lord's wrath. Sometimes I feel like I'm being punished. But notice what it says. Until he pleads my case and upholds my cause, he will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. I'm guilty. But Joseph is watching out for his brothers. And Jesus has died for our sins. He's watching out for us. Here's another verse. Job 16, 19. Even now my witness is in heaven. Jesus is our witness. He knows we love him. He knows that we we want to serve him. My advocate is there on high. My friends scorn me. But I pour out my tears to God. I need someone to mediate between God and me as a person mediates between friends. For soon I must go down the road from which I will never return. I need a savior. I need somebody to stand up for me. Now I want to just share something that a a very good author has written that I think gives us a lot of hope. And she says this, make friendship with Christ today. Jesus can be our friend. Put your case. You have a case in the judgment. She's talking about the judgment. Put your case in the hands of the great advocate. He will plead your case, your cause before the Father. Though you have transgressed the law, and we must plead guilty, guilty before God. We have sinned. We've disobeyed. We plead guilty. Christ will present his precious blood in your behalf. And through faith and obedience, 
and a vital union with Christ, you may stand, what? Acquitted, forgiven, clean, free before God. Acquitted before the judge of all the earth, and he will be your friend when the final trump shall sound and the scenes of earth shall be no more. Is your case in the hands of Jesus this morning? Is he your friend in court? In the investigative judgment, the great pre-advent judgment, how will you stand? We must plead guilty, but Jesus is our Savior. Are you walking with him? Are you talking with him? Is he your friend? Do you love him? The Bible says, dear, my dear children, dear loved ones, dear church members, my dear friends, I write this to you so that you will not sin. God doesn't want us to sin. He wants us to serve him, to love him, and obey him. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who stands up for us, defends us, and fights for us. He loves us, and he cares for you. He's doing all he can to save you and to get you into heaven. Do you love him this morning? Are you serving him today? Are you walking with him? Do you study his word? And do you pray to him? Is he your friend? Is he your companion on the journey of life? Do you turn to him to help you help him solve your problems? He wants to be your savior. He wants to be your friend. I hope you'll put your case in the hands of the great advocate, Jesus, our mediator, who is before our Father today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and care and your compassion. I pray that as we go through this world, we too, Father, admit we are sinners. We have transgressed, but we know that we can claim the blood of Jesus. We thank you for our great high priest, the ministry of Jesus, who stands in our place, whose life is spotless and obedient. So we put our hands in his case, Father. We thank you for his redeeming love, and we pray that we will grow day by day to have a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing a closing hymn, a beautiful hymn called Covered with His Life. And just listen to the words of this great hymn. Please stand.
Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll dismiss us with your blessing. We thank you for the perfect life of Jesus, for his love that has been poured down through us in the cross. We thank you for the hope we have of your soon coming. Thank you that you are a divine human savior, that you walk with us through all the struggles of life. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And I pray you'll go with us now. Fill us with your spirit. May your angels dwell about us and give us a good week, we ask. Guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today and have a very happy Sabbath. Amen.